Welcome to Immortal Visualizations. This is our very first public event for Reuben College, and we've organized this in collaboration with the Bodleian Libraries. It's part of our founding partnership with the University of Oxford's GLAM unit. That stands for its Gardens, Libraries and Museums. And we're going to be holding events like this throughout the academic, academic year, hopefully not all online. In fact, our next one is going to take place in person, if all goes according to plan, at the Oxford Botanic Garden on the 23rd of June. So please do look up that up on our website. It will be very limited spaces. So snap up a, a registration if you would like to join us there. The aim of this, these kinds of events is to take a deep dive into some of the university's incredible collections, many of which remain hidden down in archives or basements. And we want to generate conversations with the guardians of those collections, the people who really know about the books, the objects, the artwork, um, and generate a conversation between them and our academics to see what kind of thoughts we can stimulate, how we can get some collaborative reflection, and what kind of questions for our research can we, can we find and discover together. So hopefully we'll achieve some of that today. I think it will be very interesting. We have uh, a great lineup of speakers for you. And I'm going to hand over now to Chris Fletcher. He's got the brilliant job title of Keeper of Special Collections at the Bodleian Libraries. And he's going to introduce our speakers to you in a little bit more about what we'll be talking about today. Thank you very much, uh, Alison, and it's great to be here and uh, welcome, uh, uh, welcome to everyone. So, um, yeah, my job title is Keeper of Special Collections at the Bodleian uh, Libraries, from which I'm, I'm broadcasting today. And the Bodleian has been collecting books and manuscripts for over 400 years from the first book written entirely in the English language, dates from about 890, um, to Shakespeare's first folio, um, all the way through to major archives, uh, many uh, relating to prominent figures in the world of science. Um, among the books that we've been acquiring recently are those conceived and published by contemporary artists interested in stretching the limits of the book's form and provoking questions about its durability and relevance in our digital age. Many of these books question and tease librarians like me. Here are two examples that we recently brought into the collections. A copy of Fahrenheit 451, whose black pages only reveal text when exposed to a flame. And a book whose 20 pages are made of American craft cheese slices. The maker of this last book was Ben Denzer, an artist, designer and publisher currently based in Boston. Well, we haven't raided our conservation fridge to show you the cheese book, but have instead two further creations by him, uh, which we very recently added to the collections and which draw upon his collaboration with the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. These are beguiling and striking in their form and ask, to, ask us to consider ethical and aesthetic questions about the presentation of valuable and sensitive data. In so doing, they investigate the interconnected worlds of art and science. Well, I'm really pleased that Ben is with us uh, here today to share his insights into these two books. Um, which you will at um, some point soon be shown live, uh, thanks to Alice Evans, a conservator, whose hands you will see under our visualizer device. Um, I'm equally glad that Ben is joined by two fellows of Oxford, Oxford's Reuben College, who, when first encountering uh, these items, responded to them in a visceral and cerebral way. I will introduce them uh, briefly in um, turn. Um, Esther, who you, you, you see there, is an associate professor of neurobiology in the Nuffield Department of Clinical Neurosciences um, here in Oxford. She currently leads a team of researchers focused on discovering the genes and biological mechanisms that regulate the development of the cerebellum 
and in exploring how the impairment of these mechanisms leads to cerebellar diseases. Um, Angeliki is Nuffield Department of Public Health Senior Fellow at the Ethox Center and a research fellow at the Wellcome Center for Ethics and Humanities, again here at the University of Oxford, where she co-leads the ethics and values theme. So um, without further ado, I'm going to invite um, Ben to kick off with a presentation. We'll then follow that um, by Esther and Angeliki's thoughts. Each will um, speak informally for, for five minutes in turn. And then um, we'll... I'm afraid I think we lost Chris for a moment. Uh, yes, and, th and then we'll open up to a conversation with everybody else. So Ben, please show us uh, and tell us a bit more about your work. Great. Well, thanks so much, Chris. I see, I see you're back. So glad your internet is working again. So thanks everybody for, for coming. So today we're gonna have a conversation around kind of this series uh, of books. Before I introduce these books in particular, I wanted to give a little bit more of context in terms of my kind of body of bookmaking work. Um, since 2018, I've been making and publishing books as Catalog Press, this name for kind of a small edition publisher where I kind of make myself and hand bind these books. And all the books are catalogs of one form or another. So catalogs of words. This is a Borges short story, typeset one word per page, each in a different typeface. Catalogs of images. This is a book called The Details. These are 2000 architectural details I've taken on my phone over the past few years, you know, arranged according to kind of type of thing. Um, this is a book called 400 People from Detroit, which takes Diego Rivera's Detroit industry murals and isolates each figure from those murals, presenting them one per page. Um, this is a book called Stamp Compositions, which presents the beautiful forms that stamps take if you remove their images and text content. Um, and then also, you know, I publish catalogs of physical objects. So this is a book that's 30 napkins from the Plaza Hotel, this famous hotel in New York. Um, Splenda Sweeteners, um, Fortunes from Fortune Cookies. You know, books that are catalogs of, of money, books that are catalogs of um, lottery tickets. So who knows how much this book is worth, you know, if you, if you scratch it and every one of them is a winner. Um, also catalogs of food, like Chris suggested. So this is a book, five ketchup packets. This is the 20 slices of cheese that the library has a, a copy of. Um, actually 20 slices of American cheese, you know, wrapped in individual plastic wraps. Um, this is a book also called 20 slices. This is 20 slices of mortadella um, sausage. And so the whole book is made of mortadella, including the title page here, the, the cover. Um, this is inlaid fat lettering, you know, just like mortadella is inlaid fat and pistachios. And then, you know, books of, of physical objects and books are physical objects. So a book of a book, this is 15 mass market, you know, paperbacks bound together as a book. So just wanted to give a super brief kind of image overview of some of the, the catalog press work in which, you know, these objects, which I've been making at the Broad are kind of situated, you know, within. And for all of kind of my bookmaking, I really think there's something powerful in kind of narrowing a focus and, and presenting um, content, you know, somewhat earnestly. Um, so the books that we're gonna be talking about today, I've been making as an artist in residence at the Broad Institute, which is this biomedical and genomic research center in, in Cambridge. So for the past year, I've been sitting in on talks, you know, presentations, which used to be in person. I started right before the pandemic. And then, you know, a lot of Zoom, you know, talks and presentations, talking with scientists. Um, and I produced, you know, this series of books. So I just want to kind of introduce each of these, these books, and then we can, we can talk about them. So this is 12,000 Skin Cells. It's a, a set of, of three books, um, in an addition of four. So this is a set of books that came from talking to researchers at the Broad's imaging platform, who kind of leveraged the power of computer algorithms to kind of mine image data um, from images of cells. And so this is a set of three books that each book contains 12,000 um, images of 12,000 fibroblasts or, or skin cells. In this case, skin cells from people with schizophrenia, skin cells from people with bipolar disorder, and skin cells from people without bipolar disorder or, or schizophrenia. And this is interesting um, because machine learning algorithms, you know, kind of show if you feed all of these images into a particular machine learning algorithm, they show that there's a statistically significant difference between the skin cells of people with bipolar disorder and with schizophrenia and people without, you know, bipolar disorder and, and schizophrenia. And so this is kind of just showing kind of what, how these images break down. Um, this is, you know, the actual cell. These are the, the fibroblasts, or these are the mitochondria. 
um, and they're around the cell nucleus. And so in mass, you know, the mitochondria of people with bipolar disorder and with schizophrenia are found closer to the nucleus of the fibroblast cells than those, you know, without schizophrenia or without bipolar disorder. And so this only kind of this, this like realization only happens if you look en masse. So, you know, the computer can take all of these images and kind of hold them simultaneously. If all these images of um, these cells with schizophrenia, all these images of these skin cells from people with bipolar disorder and comparing them against all these images of, of skin cells from people without either of these two things. And so, you know, my interest in making a book is kind of showing this kind of huge amount of data. And, you know, as, you know, we as people with normal eyes and brains look at this, you know, you can see these cells, but you can't hold all of them together in this way. And the way this book is, these books are constructed is it's spiral bound. And each of the signatures or each of the groups of pages has a particular, you know, individual patient from, from the study. So all of these cells in this one little group are from, you know, one, one person. And that's why you have these pages where it kind of goes from one to the next. Okay, the next book um, that we're talking about today is this book, 60,000 Immortal Individuals, where as I was talking to scientists at the Broad, another thing I became fascinated with was how cell lines are used in scientific research to serve as kind of models for experiments. So the idea of, you know, cells taken from individuals that are then um, like kind of live on in, in a lab to serve, you know, in petri dishes for experiments. And the idea of immortalized cell lines, cell lines that can live on, you know, to eternity and propagate, you know, infinitely as long as the fridges are kept plugged in was also really you know, interesting to me. And it seemed like there are a lot of cell lines like this used in scientific research. So I asked around trying to find if there was some, you know, standardized database kind of collecting information about all of these cell lines. And someone at the Broad pointed me to this database called Cellosaurus, um, which is, you know, a project as part of the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics that attempts to collect and describe all of these cell lines used in research. And I reached out to them and kind of learned, you know, a little bit more about their database and about cell lines. So they're trying to kind of gather all of the cell lines, but their database will never, you know, be complete because there are lots of cell lines in use that aren't, you know, publicly available. There are um, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies that make cell lines that never get, you know, put into publications. And so there's probably way more, you know, than 60,000 immortal individuals out there, but this book is kind of a selection of the information about these cell lines that are publicly available. And so, you know, I kind of took this database of information about each cell lines and turned these ex this Excel, you know, document essentially into, into this book. We're taking the, the line that kind of represents a cell line and structuring it so that we kind of focus more on the individual. So presenting this information in the way where each entry, you know, says what we know about this individual whose cells are now immortalized. So, you know, 72-year-old male with Parkinson's disease. 38 year old female with Parkinson's disease. And so the way the, the kind of structure works is it's the age, the sex, you know, with whatever disease might be listed that the person had. The individuals are listed in order of the name of their cell, of the name of their cell line. So, you know, that's what's here, the, the name. And then it also lists the kind of tissue on which the, these tissues, uh, the cells were, were taken from. And another kind of metric that's used to describe cells in these databases is, is population. Um, so terms used for population, you know, we have, you know, 68 year old Japanese male, 25 year old Caucasian male. Um, these terms used for population vary, you know, as the cell source is essentially this kind of scraping together of different databases of cell lines that are made at different times, you know, in different places by different you know, people. And I think there are definitely conversations to be had around, you know, ethics and categorizations when it comes to kind of the specific words and, and terms that are baked into, into these databases. And so most of these cell lines are anonymized, you know, but there are some examples where names and stories of individuals are known. And I call these out, you know, with smaller sheets of paper integrated into the binding. So the most famous example of this is Henrietta Lacks, whose, you know, cells were the first cells to kind of become an immortalized cell line, you know, from um, a, a tumor she had. And when this was done, you know, Henrietta Lacks, um, neither her nor her family knew that her cell lines were being taken and used for this research or that the cell line was being created and used. Um, and so there's lots of ethical, you know, implications from, from all of this. There's a good book called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks that was also turned into a movie that kind of details and introduces all of these ethical, you know, implications. Another kind of famous ethical, you know, example of, of cell lines is John Moore, 
um, whose cancer cells you know, were developed into a cell line that was then patented by the researcher at UCLA and UCLA itself. And you know, John Moore then tried to sue um, UCLA to get you know, the rights to what he was claiming was his property you know, that was being used to, to generate a, a profit. Um, and the Supreme Court of California ruled that you know, hospital patients you know, discarded blood and tissues are actually not their property if they're given you know, for, for research. There are also names that are called out in the book um, that are kind of less, bring up less ethical questions, but we know them because the, the patient or the family uh, of the patient decided to you know, make their name public. This is Christy Thomas, who is a, a nine-year-old who passed away in 2006 of neuroblastoma. Um, and her family kind of told the story of how her cells became a cell line to help you know, with research. And the name of the cell line, I believe, was named by her father. The cell line is FUNB2006. You know, it stands for you know, Fuck You Neuroblastoma 2006. And so that's why we know, you know this name and, and story. And so I wanted to highlight the names of these individuals who were known because they are known and it opens up these conversations. I think it also helps kind of convey the idea that each one of these 60,000 individuals, you know, is an individual who, you know, existed in the world and has a story, you know, whether we know it or, or not. And so 60,000 is a lot. And so this book, you know, is this big physical object. And there's something also that I like about having the the physical feeling of how much data, you know, this is and how many people and individuals, you know, this is. And so the binding, you know, physically shows this. This is a, a spiral binding of spiral bindings, essentially. So um, these, these little, these books are kind of spiral bound in smaller sections, and then those are spiral bound together. And so all the books kind of that I'm making at the road right now also play with this idea of spiral binding. You know, one as a way to kind of make these infinitely large books and also kind of as somewhat of a visual nod to you know the way you know double helix structure on dna you know it's not quite the same thing but you know it has a little bit of, of resonance there and so i'm interested in these books for their specifics like i kind of just described but also for the idea in general of kind of presenting data in this physical way and how so much of biomedical research today kind of hinges upon analyzing huge you know un understandably large amounts uh, of data and sorting it and, and getting insights from it. And so I find it useful and interesting to kind of visualize that in a tangible, you know, physical way. I think showing the, the structure is, is great. Um, Henrietta Lacks is towards the middle or which is a, yeah, there's Christy Thomas. And so each one of those pink pages, you know, is an individual who is publicly, you know, kind of known their name. Okay, and uh, Alice, can you just, just pick it up again for us so we can get a sense of that structure? And so there's a yellow spiral, you know, and then a pink spiral on the outside of the yellow. Wonderful. So is it time to, to, to move on to um, Esther's, Esther's response to this as a, a scientist at the, the sharp end? Yes, sure. Uh, thank you, Chris. And, and thank you, Ben, uh, so much. It's been really fascinating to hear how you came up with the idea and what your thoughts were with, with this, uh, well, what it meant to you making these books. Um, for me, when I when I first saw them, I was really fascinated, and I felt like I felt some a real connection with the books because it's very closely linked to what I do in my research life and things you know we think about in the lab and and, and outside of the lab. So, um, as Chris said, I'm a neurobiologist. We work with cell lines all the time. <laughs> it's one of the workhorses in the lab. Um, and that we that we used to understand biology, you know, what is the function of genes of proteins? Where are they? What do they do? How do cells come together and so forth? And, and we've learned an awful lot about 
um, normal function, but also diseases using these uh, these cell lines. And I was going to give a specific example, and, and Ben, uh, of course, talked to you already about that of Henrietta Lacks uh, cells. And before I had even seen that she had the little slip in the book, you know, I immediately thought of her because she's a, one of the most famous examples of cell lines uh, that have been grown now since the 50s. And, and I read somewhere that they have proliferated so much over the years that if you were to wrap around the cells um, around the globe, they would wrap around about three times around the globe, uh, which is amazing because these cells are tiny, uh, you know, 40 microns, so you need 25 to make a millimeter. So scientists have used them now, now for, for decades. And that was the real cool thing when scientists discovered that if you take these cells that come from a tumor from a patient, you can keep them forever in the lab with, you know, just a bit of uh, uh, sugar and amino acids and, and keep them happily um, growing. So, and, and, you know, specifically HeLa cells have been accredited to, to I think, two Nobel Prizes and lots of discoveries, including discovery of polio vaccine, HIV virus was identified or discovered using these cells. So amazing what we've done with cell lines. Um, but at the same time, there's some such a common tool in the lab that I think on a day-to-day -day basis, we don't really think you know, where they come from uh, anymore when we handle them in the lab. They're just like any other thing we use in the lab. And so that's what I find really fascinating about the book and the way it's put together, that it, it makes you really think and step back a little bit from the research that we do. So just looking at it, these lists um, really brought to me home the message of the vastness of, of these cell lines that we have. And as Ben said, this is not even all the cell lines that exist. Um, and also, um, having, I was fortunate enough that Chris showed me the book physically, and then I hope everybody got a sense of that just with the visualizer, especially the format of the book, because it's so big, also increases this awareness of, how, you know, all these different cell lines. And, and also, to me, it made me feel quite humble as a scientist, again, to see these lists of cell lines that ultimately all come from, um, from individuals um, and every cell line has sort of a story to tell because often they come or mostly they come from individuals who suffer from a disease, uh, you know, often cancer, um, but also other disorders. So, um, like I said, we, we, we don't always think about that when we just keep on with our daily work in the lab, but the book is a, is a really powerful way, I think, to bring this message home to, to scientists in particular. Um, but, but of course, everybody. Um, and then the other, the other immediate thought I had when I looked at the book and, and Ben already touched on that is also is sort of thinking about anonymity and research and consent. Um, again, uh, Henrietta Lacks as the most famous example, um, whose cells were taken without her consent. Also, she was an African-American woman. So recently, uh, there has actually been quite a bit of press again uh, about that in the um, context of the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. Um, and I think it's not only that the cells were taken without consent, but then for decades afterwards, scientists and doctors, they published her medical history, you know, they published her name, um, and they even published her genome. And of course, that's shared with all <laughs> the rest of her family and nobody consented to that. And actually later that was withdrawn. So it raises, again, the book, the way it's, it's presented raises a lot of questions about anonymity and, and consent. And I'm sure that Ankeliki as, as an ethicist will have uh, much more, more to say um, about that. But again, it makes us sort of step back and think about where these cells come from and what is involved in giving cells to research and what you get back from it, um, uh, perhaps or not. Um, so yeah, so really fascinating. And uh, equally the, the skin cell book um, from a biological point of view, really interesting that we have these skin cells that to the naked eye look the same. And again, because there's so many pages with the same looking cells, again, it brings home this idea of vastness um, of these cells. and 
is really interesting that we need then to use machine learning to to discover or unravel uh, any differences that our you know the normal eye even used by using a microscope won't won't detect um and i thought the other really cool thing for a biologist or a neurobiologist is of course these are skin cells from patients with uh, schizophrenia and bipolar so clearly brain disorders um, but even using skin cells we can get these amazing insights into the biology and what might be um abnormal in these cells which which is is really um powerful so amazing work ben really um really cool thanks so much thanks esther i must say you know we've been existing in this digital world and um, when you came physically in to look at the books it was a wonderful analog jolt and um, your response was 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 wonderful as was as was that so um, um now it'd be good to hear from Angeliki um, and um, again you know this this book in in our conversations really inspired all sorts of, of interesting thoughts from you so so do share. Thank you. I mean, I, thank you, Ben, again. Uh, it was really interesting to hear from you, to hear like from the horse's mouth, <laughs> in a way, like the thought and, and behind creating these books, what you were trying to demonstrate. But that is one of the interesting things that, you know, the intention of the artist and then and also, you know, what that brings uh, about to the to the to the person who's looking at these objects of art as well, that might be different, but it's always quite interesting to see what's behind, what is the intention and whether that intention comes forward and hearing Esther talk about the way that kind of seeing this, like this massive volume of, of uh, entries kind of made her feel about, about the, you know, that, you know, made her think about the people behind the cell lines that she used in her, in her, in her um, laboratory. And this is all quite interesting. I mean, from, you've already, both Esther and Ben kind of um, mentioned a number of ethical issues or an ethical question that these things arise. But what is quite interesting for me as well is um, how the presence of the object brings this, um, the presence of these people kind of makes it obvious to, to the people who are using the cell lines, this presence and make them think about these ethical issues, make them think about the people behind them. And I think this is quite a powerful thing that art can, can bring into science, can bring also in conversation with the public generally as well, as well with the scientists. Uh, who are using this, um, uh, these tools. Uh, I mean, you, like Esther and, and, and Ben already mentioned the Henrietta Lacks case, and this is kind of a famous in the ethics or bioethics world, this is a famous case, um, particularly about around issues of consent and anonymity that you already touched upon. Um, and these are important questions and we can see how things changed in the way that we think about patients, the way that we think about research participation, the way that we think about who has a right to what uh, in certain ways uh, from the kind of 40s and the 50s to, to today. And that is not to say that things have been resolved, but conversations keep happening about these particular issues. And now with new technologies, this idea of anonymity, and that kind of goes back to the kind of AI and all that um, kind of discussions is kind of raised again um, as, as, a, as an important, important question. But there's another thing that I think about the Henrietta Lacks case that I would like to bring forward which I think is not, I mean, a lot of the time we focus on, on the consent problem uh, around this case, but I think there is another problem there is about kind of access to healthcare. And then reading Scott's book about Henrietta Lacks is the immortal life of, of Henrietta Lacks. And she interviewed her family and they all said that, I mean, yes, consent wasn't um, um, taken from, from our mother when the cells were removed, but we know that she would have agreed to that because she was this kind of person that she would have liked other people to benefit from even from her uh, misfortune uh, because she died of, of, of her cancer. Um, and we were happy with that and we're happy to hear about all these amazing discoveries that her cell lines uh, helped bring about. But their question was, how come we do not have access to, to healthcare? Uh, like all these amazing things have happened, um, our own kind of information, because as, as uh, Esther said, like even the genome uh, was um, uh, released open access and then, and then people felt like, oh, wait a minute, there is actually a family behind that, there are real people behind that. And then it was the whole discussion, then it was removed. But I think that is a quite an interesting uh, question about how come there's all these people, 60,000 people 
in your in your catalog that had contributed to the kind of advancement of medicine. Uh, and then, and yet there's so many people out there who still do not have access to healthcare. And I think that brings it back to art as well, because a lot of your books are quite a limited edition and they're kept in, in private collections. So a lot of the people, and maybe some of the people or the descendants of the people who are in these books will not have access. So I think it, it's, it's an interesting question for art and for science as well. How do we see who has a right to this, um, you know, to the products, let's say, or to the outcomes of this type of, of, um, uh, of exercises in a way. So it will be nice to hear your reflections on that as well. And then there are a lot of other things uh, that I would like to, to bring about. I mean, the idea of the catalog and, and the anonymity. Um, as I was looking at the book, like another thing that came to my mind is like, it, it is a catalog of useful tools in science, but also it's, it's almost like a memorial. The way that I was reading these lines, like male, uh, Hispanic origin, uh, and a lot of the time, the, the thing that uh, probably um, killed them, uh, may, a lot of the time they had cancer, probably some of these people, I suspect, they passed away uh, uh, in, uh, uh, of, of these diseases. And re it reminded me of this memorial, war memorials where you go, and there is a lot of anonymous people, uh, and there is like just very little entries there. And because we think of immortality as kind of connected with being autonomous, like we remember people, now we remember Henrietta Lacks. Uh, it was interesting to hear also this uh, story about Christy Thomas that they decided to make her autonomous because now we know her name. So she's not just one line in, in a catalog somewhere. And I think that it will be also interesting to hear your thoughts around that. And I think there are interesting ethical issues about what you said, how do we present these, how do we present this information? Like what do we reveal, what do we conceal every time we describe someone or something with certain kind of um, tags. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so lots of questions there. And um, pe perhaps I could sort of open it up to, to the, th the three of you for a more general discussion. But, but it, it, I, you know, a question that Angeliki had, which really chimed with me, and perhaps as you know, librarian and collector of books, is just this question of, of audience and who is this for? And these are, these are rare books. You could call them you know, collector's items. This is in a public institution. And of course, we want to be able to share this as, as widely as we can, but there will probably be private collectors as well. So I'm just, I'm just interested in, in, in that equation if you like. Anyway, that's a, a kind of kickoff question um, from me, but, but over to you three. Yeah, definitely. Oh, go ahead. No, no, I, I'll let you answer that question. I just wanted to, to follow up on what Chris just said. I mean, had it not been for Rubin College and its really um, cool partnership with the, with the libraries and with GLAM in Oxford, uh, I would have probably never become aware of your work um, and that these books exist. Yeah, definitely. Um, and they are made in these small editions. So the Immortal Individuals book, there's six copies uh, of this book that I've made. And in terms of, like, I think you're asking what the ideal audience is or what the audience is. Like, I guess the ideal audience for the physical object itself is a place like, you know, this library, a place, you know, public libraries where the thing can sit and, you know, not be thrown out. And then someone, you know, people can come and visit it and it can be shared and, and start conversations like this. You know, there's only six because it's me printing these books and, you know, spiral binding them together. And the process takes, takes a long, you know, time. And, you know, it's also, I guess we're getting into questions about like, what is the market for art and how, you know, there's, there's economics involved too. Like if I could, make a thousand copies and you know give them out on the street and that you know made sense from from my perspective to not just be hemorrhaging you know all of my resources and that that would be great um so for me an important part of any book that i make you know inherently they're in relatively small quantities because i'm the one making them um so for me the project isn't really done until i have quality photos of it and you know i know that i'm making these few objects, which if I'm lucky will land in a place like this library where then they can start conversations like this. But I know that most people won't see them there. They'll see them through the images, just like 
you know, most people see images of things rather than the real thing anyway in our, in our current world. So for me, it's important to, you know, document the book and the pages in a way that people can feel the size and also see the content. And then, you know, for me, I upload that to my catalogpress.org website. Um, so there's this broader audience that sees the images and then there's, you know, a smaller audience that gets to see the physical things, but ideally they're in places where they are accessible, you know, where, um, you know, someone can just go and make an appointment at the library to, to check out the book. And I think that's a, a great aspect of it. I mean, we quite, of course, we quite, you know, we like rarity, um, you know, and, and one of the reasons we like collecting your books is because you can't see them everywhere. Um, and so it's, it's an interesting sort of tension, but of course we want to promote them in, um, in exercises like this. And I mean, just the technical skill. Um, I mean, how long does a single book like that take to, to make? Yeah, it took, a, I, I didn't record the explicit amount of time, but it took quite, quite a few months to, you know, gather it, figure out the, um, you know, the, the design of it, put it all together, print it, and then, you know, spiral it all together. It's, I guess it's less technical skill than amount of, of, of time spent. Um, but definitely a, a long process. And maybe for the, for the, I mean, I don't know how long you sort of envisage this book lasting, but, but maybe a question to the scientists about this concept of immortality and, and you know, sustaining um, these, these, these cells indefinitely, um, but also the, the data. I mean, how does, how does the data, survive, continue to live um, in both public and private contexts. And, and, and that must raise some interesting ethical issues. Who owns them? Yeah, I, well, if I start with, the, you know, the data around it belongs to the, I think the discovering labs and they keep them for some time and the most interesting data are being published and of course released to everyone. Probably the majority of data that we gain from these cells uh, will never make it um, <laughs> because there might be negative results or things that haven't worked and these things usually don't get published in science. So there's a lot of knowledge and, you know, um, data that will just be kept uh, in labs and eventually will disappear without anybody uh, seeing them. I mean, the, yes, this, this question about ownership uh, and I think the Moore's case kind of brings this very kind of to the fore as well. Again, that was one of the, the other kind of white tags in, in the book. And like uh, Moore was the first person who effectively challenged that, didn't he? And said like, well, you're creating. So in the beginning, it was the time where a lot of these cell lines were just shared without any, not, not without intention, but there was not a monetary intention behind it. It was like, you know, one lab had some and then someone knew someone from that lab and said like, oh, we have these ama amazing cell lines and we can send them to you because you can use them and people would share them quite openly. And then at some point they realize like, okay, this is something that we can, we can monetize. Like this is, the, there's a business <laughs> model somewhere around here. And then I think it was around the eighties then where this happened. And Moore was one of these, the first people who effectively challenged and said like, well, if you are creating, um, if you're using my information effectively to do things and to create new products that lay down the line, someone will be selling a pharmaceutical company. If something comes out of that, We'll be creating a product. We're selling on. Then maybe I should have some, you know, I should have a stake in there as well. And that that is, um, I mean, as as Ben said, that that was challenged. But that kind of brings about the way how science works. But also when we enter the like the other type of domains, then ethical issues and and practical issues become a lot more complicated. And there is always this impression that um, ownership and individuality will resolve these problems. But as we're seeing, for example, nowadays with the proliferation of data, you know, now it's not just your cell lines, like if you were part of a particular project and then there is a very kind of physical kind of tissue uh, is kept somewhere in the lab, but now like our whole lives are, are datafied and can be used for all sorts of types of research. 
And there is a lot of interest in discussions about how do we manage that? So who, who should have access and who should have ownership of this information? And a lot of the time we kind of revert back to this idea that I should have access, like the same way that Moore was saying, this is mine and I should, I should, be, I should have a say on how it is used and what happens in the end. But that creates such a big burden on people to manage this information. So it seems that maybe what might seem as the obvious kind of um, solution to an ethical problem might not be the most beneficial in, in many ways. So like a lot of different discussions and we need to start thinking about data and we need to start thinking about the conversation and the interaction between science, medicine and everyday life in, in, in different ways. And I would say that, uh, you know, there's, we need to think about solutions to these problems that move beyond the individual owner, the individual person who is there kind of keeping uh, and having the sole responsibility for maintaining those things. The same way as in, like, so I think institutions like universities and like, you know, kind of uh, the, the, even the, the, the medical research as an institution, as a global institution should come in and take some responsibility for those things. Absolutely. So I think we need to be a bit more um, aware of these problems and at the same time, look for solutions in other places as well. Thank you, Angeliki. I'm going to jump in there. So you can see, I can't you everyone, that, that there are any, any number of directions you can take these kinds of questions and, and prompt thinking. We do have quite a few questions coming in through our Q&A um, from some of the participants. So I'd like to throw some of these at you. Um, our first question has come from some an anonymous attendee. <laughs> not an immortalized anonymous person, I think, not yet, but um, who loves your work, Ben, and would like to know about if there's any significance about the font sizes, because you've got the different font sizes, and why you chose the colors and format of these tall, skinny books, if you could tell us a bit about that. Um, and we do have quite a few more questions, so um, we'll leave yeah, them on. Um, so the sizes kind of vary partially because the you know, an interest in how scientists deal with all this data is they're forced to use kind of algorithms to deal with the data. And the same, you know, is true in kind of putting a book like this together. So it's somewhat of a, a, an algorithm in terms of um, if the information, you know, there's a max size that the type can be, um, and there's a minimum size that the type can be, and then it goes the max size that it can be to kind of fill up, like maybe if you can flip through a few of the pages, you can see some of the um, variation. Um, so when it's just male and female, that's the max size that the type will, will be. And then you see it tries to go out to the edges of the size of the pages and gets the type as big as you know, possible so that it touches one of the edge. And you know, what I also like about that is it creates this variation, which you know, is visually interesting, but also you know, gets more at this idea of these all being individuals you know, who are all you know, have different lives and, and different you know, people. Um, in terms of the, the colors and the size, you know, as someone who makes books, I think books are more interesting and effective where they're slightly different or slightly odd. So, you know, that's kind of where some of the, the size decisions come from. Before this, I had just made a collection of poems um, by my future grandfather-in-law, Sidney Offit. Um, and I also made this as a yellow book that's kind of tall and, and skinny. And so another thing about immortal individuals, the idea of books and, and immortality, um, you know, Books are also a way that people, you know, gain immortality, kind of like we were saying before, you know, there are lots of books that Chris keeps at the library that those people are effectively, you know, immortal because Chris is there, you know, keeping the dust off of them and keeping them active and keeping them read and, and talked about. Um, and so kind of tying it to this other book was kind of why I chose the yellow as well. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, a quick question. I think we can answer quite quickly for Chris. Are we going to have these books on display at the Bodleian at some point? Um, I'm sure we will make every every effort to do that when we see an opportunity. One thing I, I would also say is that um, one of the things that really informs uh, some of the decisions we make about acquiring books like this is how we can use them with um, classes. So um, sort of public show and tells and uh, teaching, teaching um, for our own students and other groups who come in. It's, it's remarkable how galvanizing an object like this is. People 
you know, come with the assumption that a book is just a book, like the kind of thing you would you'd find in a, in a bookstore. You know, never really thought about the material form or, 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 or the wit around the design. And when you put something like this in front of them, it really, really gets them thinking. So it will be used and when we can displayed for sure. Excellent, thanks, Chris. Um, I think we have a question a bit more for the academics here about whether, um, from one of our attendees, has this new understanding of skin cell differences led to any new research into why cells differ between different patient groups? I don't know if Ben actually already knows the answer to that or if that might be um, for our scientists. So I think this is stuff that these scientists at, at, at the Broad, and this book is actually a um, collaboration with the Broad and researchers at McLean Hospital, which is also in Boston. And I think this is, I, I think they've been working on publishing stuff and I think it's not quite totally fully published yet. And I, the short answer is I don't totally know my, myself. I know enough to be interested in, you know, I don't know enough to the point of being able to explain it all. Um, but I'm looking forward to talking more about them, you know, as their research kind of continues. Esther, do you yeah, maybe know? just as a follow up, I think this is very much ongoing, you know, this type of research, but what is really powerful about it is that, as I said before, you know, when we study brain diseases, um, it's very hard to <laughs> look at brain cells directly because obviously we can't just, you know, take, take a few from somebody um, and to study them. So um, it's really fantastic opportunity now. If we, if we know or we find out, we can, for example, take skin cells, which of course are accessible from somebody and you can culture them and study them. So if they can give us insight into brain diseases, then that opens a lot new possibilities to study these disorders. Um, yeah, and well, one day hopefully you know develop treatments and and things like that but so they it's really powerful uh if we can find differences in skin cells specifically for brain diseases yes that that to me is absolutely fascinating um it shows we have a whole whole body here that interacts in ways that we still don't understand we have two more questions and i think we'll address these and then wrap up with any sort of closing thoughts uh, so one question is um, the comparison with the war memorials is very interesting. And, and this participant is asking, what does immortality really mean? And does the panel think we should make more effort to record the stories of these 60,000 individuals and not just their actual cell lines in a way of memorializing their contributions to society? Um, whoever made that at first comparison might want to leap in there <laughs> first to answer that one. I think that, that was me. I think that is a very interesting question, whether we should um, reveal more or try to find more information about these people's lives behind. Um, I think that, <laughs> I think probably we'll, uh, we'll have to um, answer a lot of questions around um, uh, confidentiality and anonymity if we were to do something like that. But it is quite interesting to, however, um, understand and reflect on the fact that a lot of the things that happen, like a lot of the, um, you know, kind of therapeutics that we are able to uh, enjoy and kind of lead healthier lives as, as a result of that is, is the product, not just of the scientists or the big names that publish or, you know, uh, or the people who have been uh, immortalized through their work, but there's a lot of other kind of everyday people who contribute in one way or the other. And if there was something that we could do with these books, even uh, would be to kind of, like, like I really enjoyed how Esther kind of looked at the books and thought like, whoa, like all these cell lines I keep in my fridge in my lab actually come from people. And if we could use these books to, even if we don't know a lot about these people's stories, but at least people will reflect that these are real human stories behind, then they might treat this, um, the tools that they use, the cell lines, or even the questions and the type of questions they use them to answer with greater respect. And I think that will be definitely a way you know, forward in terms of kind of um, resolving some of the ethical issues around science. Thank you. Uh, we, we're, we're getting more questions now, um, of course, because this is absolutely fascinating, isn't it? Um, uh, uh, yes. 
Um, so I, I've got my own questions, but I'm going to let the attendees do some. Um, great book comes another question. And one thing that comes to mind is the size of the book about if you're immortalizing individuals by consuming raw materials that could affect the environment, if we make lots of copies, then what do you think about the impact of of that on our environment and and uh, ethics around that decision. Yeah, um, you know, I guess in terms of the size of the book, I think the book is big, but I think the, you know, it's physical books use paper and paper comes from trees, you know, and so this is a, it is a conversation about the environment to be had in terms of whenever like any choice humans have in the world, you know, has a conversation about the environment in terms of, especially when you choose to make something, you know, that didn't, that wasn't around before I took this paper and used it in this particular way. Um, so I think that is definitely a, you know, conversation to be had. Um, I think there's also interesting conversations that are coming up now because of um, digital currencies and blockchain, you know, also about how the digital, you know, I think that's, the digital has always had an environmental footprint, but this, you know, kind of makes it more, extreme and, and makes it more of a conversation. Um, so I think these are things that exist in both physical and digital, but definitely in terms of when people make art, you know, it's not like my art is saving lives or anything. So should this have kept in a tree? Maybe. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Um, we have a real philosopher among our attendees who thanks you all very much for the incredibly insightful talk. And out of curiosity, wants to know what your thoughts are on the link between death and immortality. So do you think an individual that an individual must die before they can be deemed immortal? Could a contemporary living person also be seen as immortal if they've had a big impact on society? Or are we just talking about this physical immortality? What What is it there? I don't know if that's an Angeliki or a Ben, if that's an artist, a scientist or an ethicist who can answer that. We'll probably have three very different answers. For, yeah, go ahead. I can, I can. Well, I think that is a very interesting conceptual question about what immortality exactly means and how we should understand it. As I would, as an immediate, I would think that someone will need to first pass away before they can become immortal. But always, always, kind of, this brings to mind the way that the ancient Greeks thought about immortality, and it was, um, if you were remembered, then you were immortal. And for them, uh, like. Hell, although the concept of hell didn't exist, or at least the same way that exists in the Judeo Christian tradition. But, you know, hell was when someone passed away, no one talked about them, remembered them. Uh, and uh, so, in a way, by immortalizing these people in these books, we do make them, uh, and maybe some of them are, 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 still, are still with us and will be good to that some of them, you know, through research, they manage to overcome whatever. Um, uh, disorder or disease uh, uh, they, they suffered from. Um, and I suppose that, yes, it may be in that way, someone can become immortal, even if they're still, he's still walking around us uh, in some way. I don't know if this has answered the question. I think that some deep philosophical and conceptual analysis will have to <laughs> happen before someone can give a definite answer to this one. Interesting. Esther or Ben, did you have any? thoughts about immortality, death, and memorializing? No, I think that was... I think that was <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I think it's... You just muted yourself, I think. I did. Yeah, uh, I our, think... Fi <laughs> our final question, uh, and this is the last one we'll be able to take, I'm afraid, because we are just about out of time. Uh, if someone's cell line... I think it's a fascinating question. If someone's cell line is used to make a discovery, should they or their families be notified of the contribution they have made to science and society? And I'd add to that, if so, how? How do we remember the achievements and discoveries? So Engeliki can probably speak to yeah. this better than I can, but just, it's my understanding, like most cell lines are anonymized. You know, the, some of the examples I was showing you are kind of at the beginning of all this when, you know, Henrietta Lacks' cell lines were named Gila, you know, because that's just what they decided to name it. But, you know, intentionally, you know, cell lines are anonymized and then that information isn't retained. So there was not a possibility to go back. And so that data is nowhere to, you know, be found. Um, and that, you know, is an important bit of, of the ethics as well of, you know, anonymizing these things. 
feel free to add. I just wanted to come back on the question of immortality. I think somebody once described the Bodleian as the arsenal of nemesis. So libraries are where things endure. Anyway, just a thought. Can I just, do we have a minute? I'll just come quickly back to the um, patients uh, who do, or individuals who donate cells and, and so just from a practical standpoint, so we, we, we do some really, really cool things uh, these days where we, we take skin cells from individuals and we reprogram them back into stem cells and then we can make pretty much any, any type of cell of the body out of these in the lab to study. Um, and so these are donated often from healthy individuals, but also from patients with a particular disease that, that we're interested in. And so when individuals are consented to give their cells for research, we always ask them whether they would like to be informed um, about the results and kept in touch. So it's actually a choice that uh, for this type of research that people have um, and say, yes, we would like to, and some people would like to, and they, you know, are very much involved because they're really interested. It's often patient families who are, of course, really interested in, of, you know, in terms of the results of, of the research. And uh, there's lots of other people who say, no, that's fine, you know, take the cells and, and do something good with it. So it's a, it's a choice um, of individuals when that when consent is made. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, Ben, Angeliki, Esther, and Chris, um, and also our helpers, uh, Alice, in the Bodleian Libraries, allowing us to see the book in sort of semi-real life. And thank you to all of our attendees who have joined us for, I hope you'll agree, what was a fascinating discussion and is going to leave us a lot <laughs> with a lot more to think about. Um, and if you like this kind of discussion, please come join more Ruben Glam seminars and maybe even write to us. Tell us what you would like to see among the university's hidden collections and what kinds of conversations you would like to have about them. That's it for now, unless Chris has any final word. No, thank you all very much for joining us and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thanks so much. Really a pleasure to have the books engaged with and talked about in this way. Excellent.